Good morning, everyone. I'm Dashran, um, a political journalist. So basically, this panel is the second panel of our of today, and it will be focused on uh, militarism and peace in Southeast Asia. Because for the longest time, we've been living under a global capitalist system. I think we've been discussing this since yesterday. And at the top of it is um, the United States of America. It's been pretty much their world, um, their system. They are dominating um, at the top of the system. Um, and, you know, after the fall of the Berlin Wall, especially, um, you know, people thought that that was it. So much so that there was a book written, The End of History, by Francis Fukuyama. So clearly, decades later, we know that is wrong, um, that book was wrong, because now we do have, over the past few decades, a, a challenge um, to the US um, imperialist order. And that challenge comes in the form of China. So this brings about a lot of opportunity, but for I think people in the Southeast Asia region, um, two big questions are in most of our minds, I think. Firstly is, um, what, how would China's rise shape the world? Um, how will it push back against the US um, dominated world order? Will we move towards a multipolar world? But more importantly, for people in Southeast Asia, I think the big question is Is China's rise going to bring benefit to us all? Um, or is it going to be a, this big socialist alternative? Or is China just going to be essentially a form of US in this region, another imperialist power? So I think these two big questions, I'm, I'm really keen to hear our panelists unpack. So um, our first um, speaker for today is Sarah Hathaway. She is a social worker and worked as a union organizer in the health sector, um, who has been recently elected as a local councillor in the city of Greater Zhulong. Um, she, she is from Australia and is part of the Socialist Alliance. Before I pass the mic to her, um, the second speaker for today will be uh, Theodore Navia. He is the chairperson of a labor group called BMP Cebu, and he's a member of the PLM National Advisory Council and the PLM International Solidarity Committee. And finally, we have um, Chu, Chu Junpai um, from PSM. Um, he was involved in student activism during his campus days. He was suspended by uh, for a semester by his university. So this guy is always uh, our troublemaker. Yeah, um, he. And I mean that as a compliment, of course. Um, he was also one of the EO6 um, who went uh, to, to jail. Um, he was protesting against the, the ISA. He's been uh, part of Suaram. And he's currently the coordinator for the International Bureau of PSM and the editor of Socialist.net. All right, so to unpack the big topic for today, I will first pass the mic to Sarah. Thank you, comrades. Um, before I get started, I just want to, to extend um, thanks to PSM, um, both from social science and I guess individually from myself. This is my um, second visit to Malaysia. Um, probably a bit of an inside joke, but I'd also like to thank the Malaysian Immigration Department for letting me into your country. Because <laughs> um, it was a near miss. They nearly sent me back home. Um, anyway. <laughs> Uh, I don't actually know what I'm going to do, so that's okay. Thanks. Hey, there we go. I, it's just pictures, there's nothing up there. So, is Australia a lapdog for the United States, or is it also an imperialist power, albeit smaller, looking to grow its own interests? This discussion has intensified in the wake of recent um, announcements of the new AUKUS Defence Treaty. Australia signed a trilateral security partnership agreement for the Indo-Pacific region with the British and US governments and announced it in September 2021. The partnership involves the US and British governments assisting Australia in acquiring nuclear-powered submarines, costing the Australian taxpayers $368 billion over the next three decades. The deal also includes cooperation on advanced cyber mechanisms, artificial intelligence, and electronic warfare. Australia is a product of colonialism since British colonialists invaded in 1788. British and now US capitalist interests have a considerable influence. Australia also has its own capitalist elite that in turn wanted to expand its imperialist role 
within the South Pacific and Southeast Asia region. Henry Parks, one of our so-called founding fathers, wrote in 1891, that Australia ought to be the mistress of the Southern Seas. The trade, the commerce, of these groups of rich islands ought to centre in our ports, and with these advantages, we ought to hold mastery of the hemisphere. An example of Australia's colonial actions in the Pacific was the enslavement of Pacific Islander peoples to work in Queensland's cotton and sugar farms up north. Sugar cane cutting and thrashing is lethal and debilitating work. At least 60,000 people were removed, mostly forcibly, but sometimes under indentured servitude. At the turn of the century, Australia's rulers made plans to take over French and German colonies located in its northeast. This accelerated at the outbreak of World War I, when Australia's rulers were quick to seize whatever Pacific territory they could, such as New Guinea, Samoa, and Nauru. They hoped to hold on to these territories after the war. At this time, the ruling class's policy towards Asia was to work in solidarity with European and US imperialism to continue colonising the region and to defeat any liberation movements. After World War II, Australia looked to the US rather than Britain, distancing itself from European colonialism, largely to defeat communist movements in neighbouring countries. Shamefully, Australia backed the Indonesian military dictator, Suharto, turning a blind eye to the massacre of up to half a million communists and activists. Australian military forces maintained bases here in Malaysia for several decades after World War II and helped the British to, to fight the Malayan Communist Party. In Australia today, we have three major parties, as well as a number of smaller political parties that run in elections. Historically, we've largely had a two-party system we have the Liberal National Party or Coalition. Can't forget my slides. Um, so it's a coalition party between the Liberals and Nationals, um, and they're the more conservative, pro-business, anti-union party. And the Australian Labor Party, which was founded in the 1890s by the unions to give political expression to the workers' movement. The emerging third force in Australia is the Australian Greens Party that has continued to increase its votes, its vote and number of seats in Parliament and is aspirational to win enough seats to force the Labor Party into a Labor-Greens coalition of sorts where the Greens hold the balance of power in Parliament. As more young people turn 18 and are allowed to vote and consciousness surrounding impacts of climate change has continued to increase, the Greens vote has continued to increase. However, they're most popular and most successful in inner city areas where soft progressive professional layers, usually university educated, are disillusioned with the Labor Party and are seeking more progressive alternatives. And why are they seeking alternatives? Because the history of the Australian Labor Party is a history of sellouts and failure to progress any progressive political agenda. After nine years of back-to-back -back conservative governments, the Australian Labor Party was voted into federal parliament in elections late last year, and almost a year on have achieved very little. Anti-union legislation still exists. They continue to approve coal mines and gas projects. They failed to address a growing housing and cost of living crisis, and failed to seriously address the increasing climate crisis resulting in worsening floods and fires each year. In August this year, the Australian Labor Party, um, which is not only a government at a federal level, but also a government in nearly all states in Australia, held its national party conference. These conferences are an opportunity for Labor Party delegates to vote on policy positions. This year, the Australian Labor Party was desperate to present a united front at the conference on two crucial issues, and they feared any dissent on AUKUS or Palestine. And this was before the events of October 7. The controversy over AUKUS involves the lives of future generations and their understanding of security via Australia's alliance with the United States military. 
On Palestine, Labor delegates needed the chance to oppose decades of collusion with successive Israeli government cruelties, including its practice of ignoring Israeli settler violence towards Palestinians. Despite AUKUS being started by the previous Liberal National Party government, there was no scrutiny or debate, neither in Parliament or at any level of the Labor Party, when they adopted AUKUS into their own policy. Labor's reported avoidance of recognising a Palestinian state derives from the same reluctance to avoid offending powerful allies as occurred in the establishment of AUKUS. So the Australian Labor Party government and scores of Australian corporations are deeply complicit in Israel's genocidal attack on Gaza through intelligence feeds from the Pine Gap, spy base and military exports. And this complicity goes hand in hand with their endorsement of Benjamin Netanyahu's um, government's bloody war on Palestinians, which is in lockstep with the United States and Imperial Allies. Declassified Australia published an article um, by investigative journalist Peter Cronow in November, which revealed that Pine Gap US surveillance base near Alice Springs is collecting an enormous range of communications and electronic intelligence from the Gaza battlefield, and this data has been provided directly to the Israel Defence Forces. David Rosenberg, a former US National Security Agency employee who worked as a team member of weapon signals analysis at Pine Gap for 18 years, told Cronell that it is monitoring the Gaza Strip and surrounding areas with all of its resources and gathering intelligence assessed to be useful to Israel. Pine Gap has satellites overhead and every one of those assets would be on those locations looking for anything that could help them. This intelligence can then be used by Israeli military to target its bombing campaigns, which have already flattened much of Gaza. Um, my numbers are out of date. I've got over 11,000. We know it's much more than that now. Um, of those who have died, two-thirds are women and children, um, according to the Gaza Health Ministry. We know hospitals, schools, homes, refugee camps, um, places of worship have all been bombed by Israel. Three human, human rights organisations, Al-Haq, Al-Nazan and the Palestinian Centre for Human Rights have filed a lawsuit in the International Criminal Court claiming that Israel's actions amount to war crimes, crimes against humanity, um, including genocide. Israel claims to be pinpointing terrorists, but a blind person can say that is an absolute lie. And this shows that Australian officials at the highest levels are deeply complicit and potentially exposed to war, cra war crimes trials in the future because the intelligence they are passing to the Israelis is being used to commit these war crimes. So on one hand, we have our Foreign Minister, Penny Wong, and Prime Minister, Anthony Albanese, saying that they support some kind of humanitarian pause and that the Israeli military should take care not to target Palestinian civilians. Well, at the same time, they know that Pine Gap and the information we're providing them um, and we're com they're complicit in what is happening. Why is the Australian government supporting dispossession and genocide of Palestinians? Besides all the obvious ge geopolitical reasons for Western nations supporting Israel, the Australian government is actively supporting genocide and dispossession of Palestinian people because this is exactly what successive governments have done to First Nations peoples in Australia. And we could probably have a whole, <laughs> a whole session on that. So the project of the former coalition government and the current Labor government is to massively expand the US military footprint in the north of the country to host more US military assets, uh, both intelligence and actual troops. What a lot of people don't know is that in 2016, there was a conscious decision to expand Australia's weapons industry to try to make Australia one of the world's biggest exporters of arms. This project began under the previous coalition government, but since Labor came in, nothing has changed. One of the most concerning elements of this is the sale of weapons to Israel and Saudi Arabia, 
the latter of which has been carrying out a brutal war against Yemen. Over the last few years, there's been numerous efforts by some journalists, Greens MPs, and anti-war activists to bring some transparency to this growing military export industry. But both the former and current governments are unwilling to do so. Australia has one of the most unaccountable arms trading systems in the world. Even the US has a more transparent system. Under questioning by Green Senator David Shoebridge, the Department of Defence told Senate estimates in late October that the government approved 350 defence export permits to Israel in the past five years, including 50 this year. However, Defence Minister Richard Miles and Deputy Prime Minister and his department have refused to reveal how these exports are being used by the Israeli military. One significant military export to Israel is parts for Israel's fleet of US-funded F-35 stealth fighters, estimated to have cost US $3 billion so far. The F-35 is being used to commit war crimes by bombing civilians, hospitals, and providing aerial support for a murderous ground invasion in Gaza. So with zero transparency, the Australian public has no idea whether our military exports could be um, being used to commit or facilitate human rights abuses, but we, we must assume that they are. One obvious area of concern, given Australia's large number of military exports to Israel, is that they likely include drones, um, components for drones, or related IT. Israel is a leader in this field, and Australia is also focused on building an international reputation in drone technology and artificial intelligence. The federal government provides significant support for research and development in this area. And we know that Israel is using drones extensively in its war on Gaza. In a bid to bust open the blanket secrecy on military exports, the Palestinian human rights groups um, have launched legal action in the Federal Court of Australia. They're seeking access to all export permits of arms and weapons to Israel granted by the Minister of Defence since October 7. Um, and the application has been supported by the Australian Centre for International Justice. So existential fear about catastrophic climate change among young people in Australia is both real and justified. A generation ago, we worried about nuclear catastrophe. In the 1980s, what we feared even more than being vaporised in a nuclear strike was dying a slow, painful, miserable and lonely death from radiation poisoning. That threat is returning as a result of the frantic military escalation that the Australian government is engaged in. Worse, we're seeing a convergence of threats posed by nuclear war and the climate crisis. And the reason for this is obvious. We can't possibly mobilise the human and material resources needed to confront the climate crisis, the real threat to our security right now, while at the same time gearing up for a new Cold War, let alone a hot war with China. We have to choose, it's one or the other. The terrifying thing is that the Australian government has chosen to gear up for war. The drumbeat in our corporate media tells us not just to prepare for war with China, but to expect it, that it's inevitable. This has been accompanied by an incessant propaganda campaign demonising China presenting it as an aggressor, while the United States continues to encircle its eastern flank with more bases and missiles. Are the US and its allies actually trying to provoke a war with China? Whatever criticisms we may have of the Chinese government, there is nothing it has done to seek war with Australia. Mixed with the mainstream narrative about the need to prepare for conflict, is that the notion that if China and the US go to war, that Australia must choose a side. We have to choose between Chinese hegemony or US hegemony, and that for whatever its faults, we should throw our lot in with the US. And this is a bankrupt logic, but it is one that anti-war movement needs to confront in Australia if it is to grow. We need to say no. 
Australia and other nations in this region can, in fact, have an independent foreign policy based on peace and justice in the world. And we must, we owe it to ourselves and future generations. Take the example of Vietnam, a country that in living memory has been invaded by both China and the US and is calling for de-escalation. Unlike Australia's politicians, the Vietnamese know what war is. So our job as socialists in Australia, and arguably for socialists internationally, is to forge a new peace movement and challenge imperialism in all its forms. Perhaps there is potential off the back of the millions who have been rallying every week on the streets of Palestine around the world. In building this movement in Australia, we have to go on our own offensive and demonstrate to Australians that we are the ones fighting for their security by campaigning for peace, and that AUKUS is a threat, not a protective measure. There is no question that we have a long way to go to establish this and overcome the warmongers. We have to look at the lessons of successful social movements, the ones that change history. In every instance, they were sustained by mass movements. They deployed diverse tactics, of course, from mass protests and begins to cultural expressions. They took time to build and reach the intensity required to overcome resistance. And that's what it will take to eliminate AUKUS. So our challenge is to build such a movement for peace, for justice, for land rights and sovereignty of oppressed nations like Palestine, First Nations or Indigenous populations around the world, and for real action on mitigating the worst impacts of climate change yet to come. And the job starts now. We can't offer anyone a guarantee of success, but the existential threats of runaway climate change and nuclear conflict are too horrific for us to do otherwise. Thank you, Thomas. Thank you very much, Sarah, for sharing your perspective, your Australian perspective. I think Australia is in a very unique position um, in this region, and it's, it'll be interesting to see what role they play moving forward. Um, as Sarah mentioned, like you know, when it comes to the Palestinian um, cause, people are protesting against their own government, like we see in the West. So it'll be very interesting to see how that develops. I will now pass the mic to Tioni to share his perspective from the Philippines. Um, I would like to extend my gratitude uh, for our warm welcoming and your hospitality. Actually, this is my second time here. Uh, back then, in the 13 years ago, I was also a speaker here. That was 2010. Yeah. By then, I was 48 years old. But now I am already a 35 senior citizen. <laughs> <laughs> so. Uh, I would start now my, my talk. Um, the U.S. and China are preparing for war. The U.S. quote-unquote Bible to Asia was the ba Barack Obama administration of military, economic, and political strategy to deploy more than half the U.S. Navy to the Pacific. During the Donald Trump administration, Intermediate range nuclear missiles freed up by the U.S. withdrawal from the intermediate range nuclear forces. Treaty in 2019. We're stationed in the Pacific. Under President Joe Biden, Washington has brought in ships from NATO allies, namely Britain, France, Germany, to join the U.S the Australian, South Korean, Japanese, and the Philippine vessels to patrol the South China Sea. The Asia-Pacific region has always been an important one for the U.S. and the Global North imperialist bloc. It is where they have waged imperialist wars against liberation struggles in Korea, Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodia. It is where they have stationed military bases and military treaties, as in the Philippines, and organized political interventions to set up and prop up dictatorships, such as in Vietnam and also in the Philippines. The central aim of the Bible of 
Asia strategy. And Washington's policy today is similar but contains important differences. It is aimed at curbing China's rising economic weight and its rapidly increasing influence in the Asia Pacific. Washington wants to regain strategic balance through direct competition with China, China being touted as its main rival. U.S. National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan asserted that the post-Cold War detente with Beijing is over. In response, China's President Xi Jinping warned that the stormy weather was ahead. The U.S. is already preparing for war in the Indo-Pacific. U.S. imperialism and other major capitalist power adopt a strategy to increase and contain China by putting up in the Pacific Command, involving 40 countries, namely Australia, New Zealand, Bangladesh, Bhutan, Brunei, Cambodia, Laos, North Korea, South Korea, and other Pacific countries. Clearly, there is imminent war in the region where you can figure out the military bases in Malaysia, South Korea, Japan, and the Philippines. The U.S. aggressive regional plans comes amid capitalism's multiple crises. These crises are pushing the U.S. the U.S. towards a more aggressive path in the world stage and is embarking on a neutralized offensive of economic and defense-based initiatives to guarantee its preeminent standing in the capitalist world. A cornerstone of its strategy was threat, drive period of aggression, the output, the IPEF, and the, the quad initiatives. Of course, the output is Australian, UK, and United States. This is the Trilateral Security Partnership, and IPEF, this is the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework for Prosperity and the Quad. This is the quadrilateral security title. Their concern is to outflank China's economic influence in the region, and its priority is to launch unilateral a military offensive, leading to rapid escalation in the militarization of the Asia Pacific region. The Philippines is in the middle of a looming theater of war between U.S. and China, in which the policy adopted by the previous Rodrigo Duterte administration of favoring the Chinese government's interest and taking a soft stance on the West Philippine Sea issue has been replaced by President Ferdinand Marcos Jr.'s shameless subservience to, its, to U.S. imperialist interests. Marcus Jr. has affirmed his patronage to U.S. imperialist interests by increasing the number of military bases in the country from the original five to nine as provided for in the uh, Enhanced Defense uh, Cooperation uh, Agreement and the Visiting Forces Agreement. In contrast, the former president of the Philippines, Rodrigo Duterte, sees this as an imminent threat of war. Aside from the military bases, the U.S. has deployed many nuclear submarines, hundreds of warships, thousand combat aircraft, and more than 300,000 soldiers, soldiers and personnel patrolling the Pacific and Indian Ocean, including the South China Sea. On the other hand, China has deployed Four nuclear submarines to guard the oceans and 350 warships, thousands of ground launch missiles capable of retaliating US bombs and air defense systems, which are scattered across China and its occupied islands in the South China Sea. China is now regarded to have the largest naval formation in the region. The left and progressive movements in the Philippines oppose these preparations for war 
by both the U.S. and China. Particular as Ambassador of PLN is campaigning for the dismantling of U.S. bases established under the Visiting Forces Agreement and the Enhanced Defense Cooperation Agreement and for the withdrawal of all troops belonging to the U.S. and its imperialist allies in the area Pacific region. PLN also calls on China to hold its militarization of the region and its bullying of countries that maintain sovereign rights over specific zones of the South China Sea. We call for the implementation of Southeast Asia nuclear weapons free treaty in order to urgently demilitarize the region and advocate for a broader Asia Pacific wide nuclear weapons free zone. We recognize that China's actions in South China Sea, we aim at expanding its defense perimeter to protect its industrial heartland in South and Southeast China from a potential attack from U.S. bases and ships that are within striking distance of the Chinese coast. That is why we have taken a more active position of focusing in campaigning against U.S. military intervention and U.S. imperialism designs for the region. And while China doesn't recognize the Arab Liberation Tribunal and the UNCLOS, the United Nations a Convention on the Law of the Sea, the U.S. unilaterally declared itself as having the right to navigate the world's oceans for its own military purposes. Therefore, PLM position is no to US military intervention in the region and no to China's military mobilization and bullying of countries with sovereign rights in parts of the South China Sea. All U.S. Uh, British imperialist troops together with foreign military forces be immediately withdrawn from Asia. And apart from that, we have still nine points to campaign for being in the Partido La Paz ng Masa. And then and the nine points are the following. Number one, of course, the closing down of five power defense arrangement. Number two, the dismantling of the Asia Pacific base, physical forces and intelligence infrastructure, uh, infrastructure of the imperialists. Number three, upholding the Southeast Asian nuclear weapons free zone treaty. Number four, advancing a common security policy by promoting progressive regional peace initiative. Number five, Supporting worldwide moves to boost non aligned movement. Number six, popularizing the idea of a shared regional area of essential commons with a progressive code of conduct. Number seven, intensifying the struggles to dismantle authoritarian, ultra rightist, and fascist regimes in the Asia Pacific. Number eight, rejecting the U.S. AUKUS, the IPTF, and Quad, and, num and lastly, number nine, expanding and consolidating working class solidarity movement and internationalism. How many? Just many so, times. You have time. I should have time. Yeah, you have time. But if you want to, you can. Okay. Yeah. An internationalist approach should prioritize building solidarity with left progressive and grassroots parties, organizations, and movements around the world. There are various networks that exist for a campaign around specific issues 
but this mostly focus on single issues and on engaging the powers that be at the level of influencing or changing government and corporate policy issues. I am referring here to the approach and adopted by the NGOs and the nebulous idea of civil society organization. We have to go beyond these types of approaches. 21st century internationalism needs to be based on putting forward a socialist alternative built to people's power governments. Otherwise, internationalism will be built on foundations of sin and has no future. We need to organize and mobilize the broad mass forces possible to a coalition of the left, progressive and grassroots parties, organizations, and movements to thwart the designs of imperialist and fascist forces and build up forces capable of capturing popular power based on transitional socialist program and a socialist alternative, even popular rhetorics to revisions such as Thomas Piketty argued for such a vision the left should do so even more. We have in a situation, we live in a situation where we have to grapple with multiple crises, economic, political, environmental, health, or among others. That is why it is not enough nor merely engage with the enemy and scatter ourselves into different movements that fight for reform while forgetting the struggle goal of capturing power and building socialism. It is now or never more barbaric, more barbarism or socialism. Thank you very much, Theodi. So I think, you know, just like the first two speakers, we are reaching a sort of, there's sort of a consensus by many, not, although some people are hesitant to say that escalation is an imminent, there will be war between US and China. So the question then is what do smaller countries do? Um, especially what does the left who want to take an internationalist approach do um, in this situation to manage um, both of these um, rising powers? So for a Malaysian perspective, I'll pass the floor to Jun Kai. Okay, thank you. Hello uh, everyone. Uh, okay, uh, just a disclaimer. Uh, actually, I'm not an expert in uh, geopolitics as well as uh, the matters related to the security and defense. So I'll just try my best to give some uh, a bit older overview about the issues and also what should the uh, response from the left uh, in Malaysia as well as in the region. Right. Okay. Right, uh, right now, actually, uh, I've been discussing uh, in this uh, two days conference, uh, global capitalism is, uh, is now entering a new historical phase of a uh, multi faceted uh, crisis where the US dominated uh, post -post war unipolar world is crumbling and uh, a possibly multi polar world is emerging. That's uh, our yesterday's session that we've been discussing with. Uh, so uh, yeah, it's uh, the, um, the cap global capitalism is in a crisis, and uh, what has written uh, by Antonio Gramsci, he said that uh, the crisis it consists of uh, precisely in the fact that the old is dying and the new cannot be born. In this interregnum, a great variety of morbid symptoms appear. So in the world today, uh, the old superpower U.S. Uh, is in decline. Some might not agree, uh, agree but there's uh, yeah, uh, a lot of people saying that uh, the US superpower is in decline, but the new super, the new one have uh, yet to fully develop their strength. And the morbid symptoms include the escalation of geopolitical conflicts in many parts of the world, as we see in Ukraine, in the Middle East, the rise of far right state mongering and alternative nationalism uh, in many countries. Uh, 
and the threats of war, including in our region. Well, after the collapse of the Soviet Union and the end of the 20th century Cold War, the US has become the world's uh, sole superpower uh, for decades. It's wielded an uh, extremely powerful economic and political influence in the, at the global stage, as well as uh, military strength to maintain its strategic interests uh, on the planet. Uh, despite this, during the first two decades of the 21st century, U.S. military strength has been overstretched by its catastrophic uh, military interventions, uh, in, uh, especially in Afghanistan and Iraq. Right, they had some initial success, but ended in uh, uh, catastrophic. Not only for the U.S. but also the uh, the people that uh, died and, uh, and suffering the, the, all the uh, impact of the wars. While the 2008 global economic crisis has deeply impacted the uh, U.S. economy as well as its hegemonic influence on the global stage. So these are the significant events that have been happening in the last, uh, the first two decades of the 21st century. Yeah, so this left why people are saying that U.S. is in decline. Yet, a declining empire is still an empire with immense strength in many aspects. And uh, for it to uh, struggle to maintain its power, hegemonic interest, it's using this, uh, various means. And uh, yes, um, by doing this, actually, they put the world in greater risk of uh, more conflicts. At the same time, we're also witnessing the rising influence of uh, so called emerging powers, especially China, uh, which are seeking to challenge or to. Uh, to deal with uh, the U.S. Uh, imperialist dominance at the global level. So China today is no more China four decades ago when it uh, just started, just began to open up uh, its economy to re-embrace global capitalism. China has emerged as an important player at the global stage and also has become the center of capital, capital accumulation uh, today in the world. The rapid economic growth in, of China uh, has now made the country second largest economy uh, in the world in terms of the GDP, uh, nominal GDP. Uh, I think it's uh, yeah, almost 18 billion, US, uh, G, uh, you know, 18,000 billion USD compared to the 26 or 27,000 uh, billion USD. Uh, and the largest in terms of GDP based on uh, purchasing power parity. Which is a uh, uh, thirty-two uh, thousand billion compared to uh, twenty-seven uh, thousand billion US. And although okay, okay, although China is because it, okay, we have to bear in mind China is uh, okay now not the largest uh, in terms of population. It's the second largest, uh, but because of the vast uh, the huge amount of population, so the GDP per capita uh, of China is. Uh, only one six uh, using the uh, GDP nominal or, or three ten uh, GDP based on GDP compared to US. So this is just a comparison that I'm uh, So the establishment of the US, um, right. the establishment of US imperialism has viewed China as its security threat. Uh, its main rival and increasingly hostile towards China, uh, and also through the the media, international media, trying to uh, uh, put uh, the image that China is threatening uh, the world, and actually is threatening China, U.S. Uh, increase uh, uh, dominance. Uh, in the communique of the NATO summit in uh, the year twenty twenty one, the U.S. and its allies in NATO explicitly affirmed that China is presenting systemic challenges. To US dominated rules based, so called rule -based, rules based international order and the security of the military alliance. Okay. So, the US is try, uh, trying to maintain its economic, political, military superiority in the Asia Pacific region or, some, or, to, or extend it to the so called Indo Pacific region. Um, with primary focus of encircling and, and uh, and uh, China. Uh, this can be seen since the Obama's visit to Asia and the Trump trade war with China and current um, Biden administration attitude towards China through the formation or strengthening uh, uh, the, uh, the 
formation of new or strengthening existing uh, military alliances with clear objectives of containing China, like the Trilateral Security Cooperation AUKUS, uh, which involves the uh, US and UK, assisting Australia to, uh, to acquire the, what the, the nuclear uh, powered submarines, uh, uh, restarting the, the, the Quad. Uh, strategic security dialogues between Australia, India, Japan, and the US since 2017, with the intention to turn it into an Asian NATO. And uh, recently, the first ever US Japan South Korea combined aerial drills in October, uh, I think two months after the uh, Camp David summit between the, uh, the leader of the three countries. Um, as part of the effort to force uh, trilateral military co cooperation in East Asia to serve the interests of the US imperialism and uh, more access for US troops in the military base to military bases, uh, like in the Philippines, under the so called Enhanced uh, Defense Cooperation Agreement. So, the, beside this, uh, the military uh, industrial complex uh, that profits from wars also a major uh, driver behind US led uh, imperialism and uh, its militarism. On the other hand, um, China has certainly has quite a, a complex role in uh, this region, the Southeast Asia region, uh, with the exception of Vietnam, which China has invaded some uh, four decades ago. Most countries in the region has peacefully coexisted with China. Um, uh, uh, but uh, recently, however, China has triggered uh, tensions and disputes in the South China Asian waters by building artificial islands uh, and also military installations and sending Chinese military vessels to patrol the disputed areas, including uh, come to near the shore of um, Malaysia. So uh, this has created, certainly created uh, concerns, tensions uh, and anxieties among governments. Well, what are you doing here? Uh, what, uh, what the China's vessel ships and uh, and your aircraft flying near to our uh, space or, or, or the so this this certainly a great uh, uh, tension and 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 also China because it's become a major power so and on China okay I'm not going to discuss because uh, there's a lot of debate about China whether socialist or socialist and also imperialist <laughs> or imperialist All right uh but I my point of view I think we should seek better understanding of China's uh, role China's complex history and its current state politically and economically. Uh, it is, uh, but of course, it is undeniable that China has become a major power, right? Okay. Yeah, say it's imperialist or not imperialist, this is not, okay. you can still debatable, but China is already a major power, uh, not only uh, influential in this region, but also an important player uh, in the geo, uh, global geopolitics today. Uh, all right, and we say that if you are saying that China is an imperialist or not imperialist, uh, but we cannot characterize China today as the um, uh, as a imperialist with the same stature as the European imperialist power in the past. For example, the, the British Empire uh, in the nineteenth uh, and uh, early twentieth century, uh, which has an uh, which had an extensive global reach, global reach at its peaks, or Germany. Uh, before the World War One, or between the, the two wars, uh, as emerging imperialist power in the late nineteenth century and early twentieth centuries, both of which uh, expanded their imperialist interest through colonization of non-capitalist states and regions. China's economic expansions, uh, together with the rapid growth, uh, in the past two decades have been has been largely peaceful. That means they're not sending armies, military to invade. Uh, because there are other issues, okay? there, are, there are issues. Uh, uh, we are, yes, but this, the expansion is without military aggression. Uh, this is uh, quite clear. Uh, but with China embracing the model of capital accumulation, right? Well, although it's called socialism with Chinese capital characteristic, and its rapidly growing economy, accompanied by the rise of ultra-nationalism within the countries emerging from its internal uh, contradiction, it certainly poses uh, the tendency of morphing into a new form of uh, imperialism if this tremendous power wielded by China is unchecked. But we, we certainly cannot rely 
on the uh, old guards, uh, which is uh, old guards of imperialism today, which is U.S. to as a uh, someone to counterbalance China because U.S. is already a superpower, right? It's uh, it's not the U.S. definitely it's not a reliable reliable balancing force for the emerging powers. As we have seen in the past, uh, uh, with U.S. catastrophic intervention in many parts of the world, uh, just for its interest, uh, and but it creates more problems, atrocities, and wars, conflicts, so on and so forth. So the rivalry of uh, these the two major powers, and on one side, the uh, an old declining but still dominant one, on the one hand. And uh, the other hand, an emerging and ambitious one. Uh, the competition to advance respective uh, geo uh, strategic interests in the new phase of global capitalism uh, has become a major factor in, in, in the increasing uh, militarization and threat to peace, uh, especially in this region. And countries, uh, when this, and, someone's, and some people say we are entering a new Cold War, uh, and and you know uh, as like the twentieth century Cold War, uh, countries uh, were pushed into camps. So uh, so in in the scenario of like the emerging of this new Cold War, countries uh, are forced to take sides and join into uh, alignment with different major powers in the in the so called multipolar world. But uh, just give some comparison first on the, the military strength. US definitely poses uh, an, an overwhelming greater military security over China, which advanced weaponry, large uh, number of uh, deployed uh, nuclear weapons, uh, um, over 700, 750 overseas bases, and vast experience in fighting wars compared to China in the last uh, four decades, definitely. Right, uh, this is uh, the chart here show uh, on the top is the, the red one is the US um, military spending uh, in a year. Actually, it's like uh, it's more than a combination of 10 uh, uh, countries uh, after US. Of course, China is the second uh, uh, largest uh, in terms of uh, military spending. Uh, so this is the map by the Progressive International. Basically, the red dots are the where the location of the military bases. Uh, okay, yeah. So the in terms of military budget, uh, uh US is like uh, over three times of the uh, uh, military spending compared to China now. But we're looking at uh, the uh, the increase of military spending over the last decade. I think China has been uh growing quite. <laughs> Yeah, sixty-three percent compared to uh, less than three percent of U.S. So that's why also some countries that think, "Hey, what China is doing? You are spending." Of course, China has been uh, modernizing their military. Uh, they're reducing the numbers of their personnel, but they are but they're modernizing by uh, upgrading their weapon, weaponry, and so on and so forth. Okay, so major first point for military confront uh confrontation in the Southeast Asia region are south. Uh, uh, there are two one. Uh, one is the, the South, East, South China Sea dispute, and the other one is the question over Taiwan. Or maybe to some extent, you can also include the crisis in Korean uh, Peninsula. Right, just very quickly, the China military claimed to the ownership of 90% of the South China Sea through the 9 9. Actually, 9 9 is not something new. Uh, before the People's Republic of China, Republic, Republic of China, which is the, 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 the government governing Taiwan now, also they have this uh, so-called 10 dash uh, line claim on this uh, South China Sea, but because of the, they don't have the strength to, to send uh, their ships here. So, <laughs> yeah. so that, like, now China is uh, having, uh, asserting it, it more, uh, uh, so some people have seen aggressively uh, in recent years uh, of this, uh, 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 the, the claim of this China, South China Sea. So it's in, in conflict with national interests of the neighboring country, of course, including Vietnam, Philippines, Malaysia, and even Indonesia. Uh, so this led to tension in the region. At the same time, the US increases uh, its military presence and step up uh, remanship in uh, uh, South China Sea in the name of freedom of navigation, which is aimed to, to defend 
uh, aimed at defending uh, military supremacy of the US over uh, Asia Pacific region, thus uh, being seen as provocation and possess unnecessary high risk in the region and led to escalation of tensions with China. Uh, of course, there are efforts actually to ease tensions uh, around the question of uh, South China Sea, like the process of trying to negotiate a code of conduct in South China Sea. Uh, but uh, my point of view, as you see, is uh, any a negotiated code of conduct uh, have to be done in a mutually respectful manner and should reflect the principles of peaceful coexistence and uh, rules that are in line with international law, especially the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea uh, and with the aim of achieving stability, safety and peace in Southeast Asia, as well as focusing on the militarization of the region. And on the question of Taiwan, the government of uh, People's Republic of China is uh, still strongly upholding its nationalist agenda of reunification without ruling out any possibility of using military force to achieve the reunification. Uh, meanwhile, the threat of military uh, invasion, well, whether it's true or not, but the, the US has been using it to increase its military presence in the region and support Taiwan uh, by selling more weapons, uh, in which in turn escalates the cross strait tension. So, yeah. Uh, so some section, okay, and some section of the international left uh, might welcome with open arms at the end of the unipolar world, uh, but at the beginning of a multipolar world. But uh, obsessing with multipolar, I think the SFD has been discussed a lot. Eh? So I think by obsessing with multipolarity in the geopolitical balance of forces between capitalists and somewhat repressive states, without genuine effort to strengthen immensely forces. Uh, from below is counterproductive in fighting imperialism and social injustice. Uh, that's my view. Uh, we have seen how the unipolar world in the last three decades brought wars into Iraq, uh, Afghanistan, Syria, Libya. Uh, but a multipolar world would also bring wars and threat of war, like what happened uh, in the period before uh, World War I. Um, um, repressive government, regardless of who they are aligned with, uh, will make use of the major power competition and the threats of other camps uh, in the so-called multipolar world to justify their continuous repression of the people who are against them, including the left in respective countries. Yet, as you have been seeing this is during the Cold War, right? In the countries that are more aligned to the West, they will use the, the, the communist Russian agents uh, to against them. And in the East, uh, yeah, they will say you are the US agents. So yeah, this is uh, the, the challenges. Okay. So hence, we should not have illusion that a multipolar world with all kinds of repressive regimes can bring about world peace, social justice, and liberation for the oppressed around the world. So uh, lastly, I think these are the, the demands. Uh, the, left, uh, the task for the left should uh, not merely align with the lesser evil in the, nature of, in, in the name of uh, anti-imperialism. Our task is to build an alternative that sustains peace with social justice and the emancipation of working people, not rely on or rarely behind any major power in the multi the so-called multipolar world. We have to strive for a sustainable peace in Southeast Asia. We must oppose any further steps toward militarization. So in the effort uh, to fight against militarism and to build lasting peace with justice in the region, as well as the world, we should call for shut down all US military bases in, in, in Asia Pacific region, for us, uh, upholding the so what uh, uh, Jody has been mentioning now, upholding the Southeast Asian nuclear weapon free zone and expand it uh, to the Asia Pacific region. Uh, resolve uh, the dispute uh, in the Southeast Asia, South China Sea through peaceful and mutually respectful dialogues between all parties and setting up a code of conduct that focuses on demilitarizing the region. So that means that well, US out and China shouldn't expand its uh, military uh, uh, installation in, in the South China Sea. And end to arm races among uh, major powers in the world and dismantle military industrial complex. Upholding the principle of non alignment among the countries, uh, especially in the global south, as the counter balance to the emerging polarization between major powers. 
and government in the region and beyond to foster genuine regional cooperation based on solidarity and shared uh, prosperity. So we on the left, we should rebuild, we should build or rebuild the working class solidarity beyond national borders to push for peace and anti anti imperialist alternatives. It is crucial for the left, with, uh, and we should build our capacity to, to, to mobilize from below to take political power at the national level in order to advance uh, the German peace initiatives and the emancipation of your class. Thank you. So, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So I think uh, China is a very interesting uh, conversation among the left because it's a topic that even the left can't seem to agree on broadly, right? You mentioned Taiwan and the left will, will definitely you know, have a lot of discussions with each other, debates and all of that. Um, so yeah, I thought I'll open the question, uh, open to the floor for questions. Um, okay, yeah, he will go around on the table. Maybe we'll collect like three questions to three, four questions at once, and then we can go from there. Okay. Sorry? Okay, you want to just collect every all the questions first and then we can go from there. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so um, my question is to uh, Miss Hathaway. Um, my question isn't about militarism, but it's something else you mentioned in your in your speech. Um, it's about the treatment of uh, your First Nation um, citizens in Australia. Uh, I I was in Australia recently, and not just it was not just official um, outlets who were making land acknowledgments. Um, but also even people I met on the streets who would tell me this was uh, occupied land who, which once belonged to uh, First Nation peoples. Um, obviously, as you make clear in your speech, um, the Australian government still has a ways to go to make up for what it has done, what it is still doing. But the thing is, um, Malaysia is still not there yet in terms of our treatment of our very own Orang Asal. Um, in, j just for some additional context, um, you can go. You can Google and, and find find out, like graphics of all the land we have stolen from um, our orang asal and how we even force them into religion and make apostasy uh, straight up illegal, making them unable to leave the religion even if they want to. So, what my question to you is: um, How can we progress as a society to make it clear that we uh, that we want to um, have? Excuse my language. Not fucked treatment of our of our natives. Uh, let me first uh, thank all three presenters. Excellent presentations and the great deal to learn. Um, and I don't really have much of a question. I have a comment. You see, I come from India, and for a long time, the Indian government, the Chinese government, have had a border dispute. Notice that I say the government. I didn't say me. Uh, it's important for the left to, to distance oneself from the nation that one is part of and look at it from an international perspective. And I would say that the so-called border dispute is, uh, between India and China is very tricky because after all, this is an arbitrary line drawn by the British who ruled us. And the so-called McMahon line, one doesn't even know where it starts and where it ends. So to simply uh, you know, fall in line with your government's own propaganda that China is invading you or vice versa doesn't make sense from a left point of view. So from 1960, to dispute all words, our party has been advocating meaningful negotiations to arrive at peace because both China and India need to work together in the context of the primary enemy of the people of the world, the U.S. imperialism. So that is a consistent state that is required even today. That's why I was very happy with uh, the last presentation, which made the point that let's not sit in judgment on what exactly China is and where it is now. I think the caution that was uh, put forward for defreezing the situation and South China Sea was very well merited. But our line on the whole should be one of trying to focus on the role of imperialism. I can understand the situation looks very different from if you're in Southeast Asia as opposed to being in India, two different uh, geographies, two different geopolitical contexts. But even so, as, as, as international socialists, we need to be very careful that we don't play into the hands of the US. It's important to distance ourselves from and highlight the criminal role of US imperialism across the world. And to recognize China's own complexities and its own very mixed uh, record in many respects, but at the same time, not to uh, kind of line up 
against people china or in that sense you know the current combination that's emerging in brics is of some value to us because it's been partly made possible by sanctions but partly also by earlier histories and russia is no angel russia is a capitalist country so i have no illusions about that but nonetheless russia china india south africa and a few other countries coming together is potentially uh, something that gives you space with the the fight against using imperialism so i think it's a very complex international situation i'm glad that the uh, participants although they highlighted their concerns about china did not uh, fall into the trap of categorizing it one way or the other i think it's uh, you know i'm not here in the business of giving certificates to countries whether they're socialist or not that's not my business my business is to try and advance the overall global democratic cause um actually my my question was in line with what he was trying to say so when we talk about the nine dash lines and um so called china imperialism uh i i just can't help but wonder what are the material reasons behind um china trying to assert itself in the south china sea uh, considering the fact that uh comrade chu has talked about how um us and their naval imperial forces have sort of uh and so called and uh you know and gender and so common policy of china especially in this region so it's just something that i wonder and i wonder if the uh, panel has any thoughts about that you've got questions at the back as well you go to the back yeah. oh, thank you hi thank you um i have a slightly tangential question um so when we're talking about like war on people in different ways i'm wondering whether it is i mean i feel it is important for the left uh to increasingly start to interrogate and conceptualize of uh the ways in which that happens domestically too like the war on drugs the war on our people through the prison system and you know and critiques of how police uh, this increasing militarization of these um and of like narcotics agencies and of um the prison systems that exploit labor and so how uh, we can start to include that critique more uh, in discourse on the left and 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 in our region i i don't hear it much and i guess as an abolitionist it is a bit disappointing that we don't have sufficient sort of like discourse around that uh, as part of the leftist conception of peace and justice right and that um these systems are very anti people um and and so what does it look like to to start legitimizing them or call into question their thoughts thanks i think dr jaykumar has a question he's in i'll get you doctor uh, i really have one question uh, okay so you can start talking okay okay so thank you to the panel for the extremely well researched and thoughtful nuanced explanation especially Thank you for Tio, thank you to Tiobi for the explosive remarks. It was very explosive. So recently we have seen, and even in the past, that the U.S. imperialism has used psychological operations and narratives to attack and to demonize not only China but their political enemies. For example, they have tried to portray Mexico as the creator of drugs that are harming the U.S. citizens. They have tried to portray Islam as a major threat towards the U.K. They have tried to portray Taiwan as being the victim of attacks from China, which is sort of propaganda that tries to bring all the Asians to fear China. And within Malaysia, we start to see some lines of race being played within Malaysia, where they are trying to put the Chinese as you know Chinese puppets. So I'm curious, and this is a question to Tiobi: What are some of the narratives or propaganda that U.S. imperialism uses to push or to make Philippines push towards? against china or towards the us and or just widely in your in philippine society and i also have a question for uh sarah in terms of australia what are some of the movements local movements or broader movements that are anti war within australia are there any broad coalitions or are there any local coalitions because i feel that the anti war coalition must be expanded from just local to international and yeah that's all i think we can take Two more questions from other time. If you have time, then we can go. Okay. Um. Thanks. Uh. 
I so I I've said some of my piece yesterday, and I apologize for hogging the mic again. Uh, I'm really concerned that uh about this position that we are trying to take, and I appreciate that Chong Kai uh trying to uh, problematize it, you know, because I think that in our desire not to be pro West, uh, and and we are taking an anti West position, right? So then we become anti anything that the West is saying, that we might be in danger of being pro-China uh, and taking on Chinese propaganda, you know, because the Chinese, uh, the CCP's uh, influencing mechanism is very powerful as well. And I think we are not aware sometimes of how powerful their influencing mechanisms are uh, that we end up taking uh, in our desire to be anti-Western imperialism, we become pro-China imperialism, okay? Uh, and and I, there's, a, there's a website that has been developed. Uh, I will uh, I will admit that uh, my organization has a small part in it, and it's called China Index, China-Index.io. Please look it up. It actually measures uh, China's influences in about 88 countries right now uh, across the world. Malaysia ranked at number 10, okay, um, uh, for being influenced by China through uh, technology, military, law enforcement. The fact that we turn away Joshua Wong uh, at the immigration a few years ago shows how much we're in the pockets of China. Okay, so so I also want to caution us that we don't do this. So my 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 position is that we need to listen to the grassroots. We need to listen to the workers across the region that are being affected by China's collaboration with their country. Uh, China doesn't need to use arms because they are relying on their own uh, the countries that they're collaborating with to punish workers for protesting. You know, in Cambodia, uh, workers that are protesting Chinese labor practices are being arrested. In Indonesia, uh, activists that are protesting coal power plants that are in, uh, funded by China are being brutalized by gangsters. Who's hiring these gangsters? So China doesn't need arms. They are relying on the people, on the countries themselves to operationalize uh, anti-workers forces against workers. So I think instead of taking this geopolitical positions uh, of experts and economists, we need to go to the ground and listen to what the workers are saying who are being affected by investments brought about by China. Thanks. Uh, actually, I'm, I'm really worried about what's happening between US and China. I think there are people in the US, there are, there are these crazy think tanks and all that, who actually see that a war with China is useful for them. And they're not talking actually of invading China and taking over. No, they're not thinking of that. They're thinking of, say, a naval blockade. You know, because then if you do a naval blockade and control the sea routes, and China can come get raw materials from the rest of Asia or Africa, that will really sabotage the Chinese economy. Won't affect the US that much, because China probably can't go to the same thing the other side. And then you have a hybrid war and you have lack of employment, you have a lack of economic growth, then can you use human rights dialogue and all that to get groups in China to cause a, a color revolution? So, I mean, this is the kind of thinking I think they are thinking, you know. For them, it's not like you have to have a war and win China. Yes, you've got to disrupt it for 10 years and hope something disrupts and something explodes there. And then you go and ask Xinjiang to break loose and you ask Tibet to break loose and you, you know. So I think there are crazy people in the West who are thinking this is possible. So I think we really need to be very, very afraid because we'll be the epicenter of that, of that war, of the trade routes being blocked. So I think we've got to think about it. It's not just something theoretical. I think it is realistic and there are idiots there who... And they're not very clever. I mean, look what they did to Iraq and Afghanistan. They thought they could win and they could, you know, so they, their thinking is not very, very mature in that way, but they have the power to do it. And there are corporations who are thinking like that. So I think we really need to be afraid for what can happen. So my question is whether our groups, you know, the South Asian groups and Australian groups should have days of protest or days of talking about, to talk about peace for the area, non neutralization and non-nuclear non zone, whether we should do something jointly, regularly, to highlight this issue, you know? I mean, 
not citing any set like what Songkai put up, what Teoti put up, those list of demands, you know, and say, you know, demilitarize, no war in our zone, you know, stay out, you know, whether we should do that and whether it's possible, are there certain days which are significant days and should we all mobilize and do something like that? Together with also non-left groups as well, you know, left groups plus plus. I think we should think about that quite seriously. And I close the questions from Ron for now. Now, I mean, just to follow up on what Dr. Jason said, just very quickly, and then we can all have the mic to just add another thing. How do we then balance the anti-human rights language that comes out of, um, of, of let's say, China and all? And because you hear in Malaysia, it's called, you know, LGBT rights is good idea for our Western values, all these things. And we see that China is taking a similar stance, Confucianism. Uh, conservatism as a thing that you know that is you know as a part of like an anti-colonization sort of language they're taking this anti-human rights thing as a part of um, anti-colonization language so how do we balance that as progressive people who are not just uh, left economically but you know we really care about human rights and all of that so uh, i'll pass the mic first to sarah thank you so much uh, yeah thank you for the um, contributions and questions. Um, yeah, I guess the first one on treatment of First Nations people in Australia, I feel like we could spend a day just talking about this. Um, so how do we progress in proving treatment of First Nations people around the world? Well, I mean, look, just in the Australian context, we don't learn about this in mainstream schools. You learn about Captain Cook came and planted a flag and then there was the gold rush and then that like that's our history that's what you learned in school like um so i think i was um it wasn't until i became a socialist in 2012 that i started to get any consciousness around the real history of our country both in australia and the role we played in the region um and then it wasn't until i was 27 at university i did an aboriginal studies unit and just blew my mind that there was genocide in Australia. Like, there's just a total disconnect with our history um, and a real push, you know, from John Howard onwards from the 90s to actually completely rewrite, like, to tell a whole new narrative about we're settlers and Captain Cook and we civilised. And, um, you know, I know if you've heard the term terra nullius, that there was, there was no people here when we came, there was only animals. And um, there's been... I guess over the last decade, maybe, I feel like a broad uh, increase in consciousness. So I think you were referring to now, like it's quite common in Australia um, at nearly every event, so there'll be an acknowledgement of country. Um, so for a non-Indigenous person, the MC or whoever's opening the event, um, saying Geelong, you'd acknowledge that we're meeting on water on country, we pay our respect to elders past and present. Um, because that was part of First Nations culture. So their cultural practice was when you go on to country, you acknowledge you do that exchange and there's a welcome, there's like a smoking ceremony and a welcome to country. So it's all been mainstream now. Um, language is being reclaimed. So learning First Nations um, words for places. So it's more like culture on the left, but like a lot of leftists will refer to Melbourne as Nam, which is the First Nations so they Things like that. Um, but then we've just had a big setback with the referendum and the voice. So it kind of feels like maybe half a step forward and three steps back sometimes. Um, but yeah, well, I, I don't really have the full context of Malaysia. Um, you know, certainly I've, I've heard some of the work that comrades are doing here. Um, and I, I don't know how much widespread knowledge there is around around Asli culture and how language and culture, like how that can be supported by the left or brought into their spaces. Um, so yeah, that's what's happening in Australia. Um, some of the local and movements in Australia that are anti-war. So um, I think at the start of this year, in January, Socialist Alliance had our party conference and we decided at the start of the year that anti-war and climate were gonna be the two focuses for this year. Um, and a few things have sort of derailed that along the way in terms of a major housing crisis we've had to respond to um, and Palestine. But probably the big thing for us is, is drawing the links. Um, that's something that's been drilled into me since I joined in 2012 is that it's the role of socialists in the movements to draw the links between the issue. 
um, which has really, you know, it's become a lot easier for us when the government decided to spend, what did I say, $368 billion on nuclear-powered submarines. Because you can go to a housing rally and talk about a housing crisis and you can say, hey, if we weren't spending $360 billion on nuclear-powered submarines, imagine how much housing we could build or imagine what we could put into healthcare or education or welfare. So it's, it's actually become a lot easier um, for activists to have those conversations. Um, I guess before Palestine kicked off, there was an emerging anti-war movement. So there's a group in Australia called... IPAN, um, Independent Peaceful Action Network. Um, and then there were new coalitions formed, um, which was like anti orcas Sydney, anti orcas Melbourne, um, specifically on the nuclear-powered submarines, um, which involved anti-war activists. There'd been um, trade unions, some trade unions support those. Um, but there's also a number of right-wing unions that are supporting the militarisation because they're saying it is jobs creation in their industry. Um, so there are unions that have come out explicitly supporting nuclear powered submarines because jobs, this is the, the dynamic that um, happens in unionism in Australia. Um, sorry, I'm just trying to think of other questions. Um, and, and recently Palestine. So um, in Australia, because our government is um, supporting Israel, since the 7th of October, there's been rallies every weekend around the country, um, hundreds of thousands of people. Um, we're seeing a level of rank and file union activity that I have not seen since I joined in 2012. There's WhatsApp groups for rank and file members in every union and every industry. There's healthcare workers organising healthcare worker rallies, particularly after the bombing of Al Shifa Hospital. Um, there's Mums for Palestine. It's just like, Blown up. Um, sorry, I shouldn't be. Yeah. Um, sorry, that was didn't mean to say that, but um, it's it's expanded really rapidly. So yes, what we're talking about now is socialist alliance. Well, we hope eventually there will be a permanent ceasefire. So then, where does all this activity go when that happens? Will can we sustain it to help rebuild Gaza? Will there keep being mobilisations? Do we want to keep pushing these demands for um, Australia to stop sending? Um, machines of war to is like there's a lot more we can be doing so we're trying to think 10 steps ahead of like when the sea permanent ceasefire is called we just don't want all activity to stop um, and then we need to channel it back into this broader um, anti-war movement um, I guess the last thing I wanted to comment on um, at Kuma's point I guess there's a saying in Australia great minds think alike because I was making some notes about um, you know what more we can be doing internationally and that's why conferences are like this are so important to meet um you know comrades from all around the region and i'm thinking outside of conferences what what can we do um it's probably too late now for international human rights day but i'm thinking for the 2024 activist calendar can we pick some key dates and have an international day of action to say all all parties in our region ngos anyone that wants to get on board on this day we're going to have a, 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 a rally or something for peace now, whatever we want to call it. Um, but I definitely think we need to be broadening this out because I know there's always a risk. We're so busy with all the campaigns and issues we're involved in. It's very, I know I go home and I get back in my bubble and I, I forget about the bigger picture. So, um, yeah, I'd really like to see that continue. The last chunk I might be able to comment on this more than me, um, but I know that Socialist Alliance, PSM, PLM, and some other parties, we started having discussions on Zoom um, about maybe like a statement for the region. I'm not too sure where that got to, but we were very keen to broaden that out and to get representatives from other um, parties and other countries in the region. So um, I'm not quite sure where that got to. Hello. Yeah. I, I would like to launch some the response that was being raised by our comrades. So this is my take on the question. Um, it has to be made clear that at this point in time, there are two nations figuring out as the one 
wanted to control the world, and this is our the imperialist nation. For the U.S., who is now the imperialist, which is uh, very ahead, but many observers are trying to say that by 2030, China will catch up. So it has to be clear uh, at this point in time. And so if we are socialists, we should not side any one of them. We have to side with the working class. And if we are with the working class, we have to campaign against war. And we have to campaign for peace. But we, will, we should not abandon other issues of the working class. The, the encroachment of China in relation to its economic power, what we have, what is manifested in Sri Lanka, the building of infrastructures, the build, build projects, and all of this, these are actually signs that China is an emerging imperialist nation. Now, how do we uh, go on with this being socialist? Of course, the anti-drugs, the, the, it's not only confined to militarism, but we have to have a, a, a continuing uh, crusade of what we have uh, already uh, being uh, accustomed to. We're socialists and we're fighting for the, the rights and welfare of the workers, and we are fighting for human rights. We are uh, addressing the problem of climate crisis, and we are also trying to ensure that we are our workers will be provided with jobs, their security, the labor standards, and the many, many benefits that are now being pushed away from us. These are all issues. We do not say here that when we are uh, calling for war, we will abandon the other issues of the working class. And this is why I said our bias is with the working class. Now we have to build stronger solidarity with the working class because our actually our enemy is not the working class it is the first one it is the imperialist nations that we would want to contend with while we are now trying to come up with many many issues of concern with many points how do we do that of course Basically, we have to continue our anti-imperialist, anti-neo-fascist, and all these things are happening right now. At the end of the day, we will not succeed if we will not be able to protect the interests and welfare of the working class. Actually, on the, on the issue of China, actually, yeah, I think it's the, on the left, we still have a lot of uh, discussion, debates on China as characteristic and also, but I think it's important also we have to look on, uh, on the, uh, what's happening on the ground, uh, Chinese investments, all that. So uh, like when, when, I talk, when I say about uh, this, uh, taking a non-aligned uh, position, also it actually means that we don't have preferential equipment uh, for investment from any big powers, right? If the U.S. Uh, firms is uh, uh, pursuing something that's uh, uh, oppressed the workers, which we are, we are protesting, same goes to China, a Chinese firm. So it's not because we are China. Then we, we don't. Uh, we, uh, yeah, no, I, I understand the, the worry of uh, the Puma, but we shouldn't also that uh, when the the is that we have problem with the Chinese uh, capital, we don't uh, we we shouldn't. Uh, Think that oh, we, are, we, are, we are protecting against it, we will, we will, we will be uh, giving uh, uh, ammunition to the US to weaponize, to weaponize it against uh, China. I think we shouldn't have this kind of worry that is stopping us from, uh, from uh, uh, critics, uh, criticize or protecting against all this injustice. We have to be not aligned with that, yeah, we have to be fair. <laughs> And, and, and no pressure treatment like to all the powers. 
And I think, uh, no, because China is uh, our neighbor, it's very our neighbor because they are, uh, they are, they are, they are, they are so close, you know? <laughs> really, uh, it's always, last time we always thought China is very far, right? It's very global. Yeah, it's, it's our neighbor. Uh, we, then we have a, have a major power in our neighborhood. Actually, uh, the countries, as small countries, definitely, you either become, uh, fall under the sphere of influence, become the, the, the uh, China become a big brothers, or the Southeast Asian countries maybe we can come together to not to against China but to form like cooperation and to have a better bargaining power with China on trade, on economic cooperation and also the security issues. I think uh, the Southeast Asian countries should do that, but I don't see that uh, happening now because the countries also have their own uh, different uh, national agenda and. Uh, the regional security actually for the any government actually is good for them if there's a uh, 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 international tensions because this can uh, divert divert the, uh, the internal uh, crisis to the through political issues. Yeah, when 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 you have a problem, then you can blame on China and this is a Chinese investment or US. What has like Bill Mahadev done? All 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 the the protesters are the US sponsor, right? Uh, or, yeah, so this is uh, the way, yeah, so I think we need a progressive government to, to have progressive government for the left, actually our biggest challenge now is to take power. So this is one, okay, of course we also need to, before we can take power, also we need to also look at this issue uh, and uh, trying to do something, uh, or at least to influence our government to take a more progressive uh, positions uh, in this kind of issues. All right. All right. All right. Thank you very much to Sarah, Tiongi, and Chungkai. I uh, will uh, that was a great discussion by all three families. I will pass over to all back to the MC Biden.